Good morning, folks. It's, it's really nice to be finally here. We've been selling Albert Lee seed for a lot of years, and it's just been a brand. And it was the weirdest thing to drive into Albert Lee yesterday, last night, and see that it's an actual place. So it's nice to be here. Um, we're going to be talking about a concept that we're um, unfortunately faced very much head on with this year. Um, it may have been a near perfect year out here in the Midwest. It was a near awful year in upstate New York and throughout most of the Northeast. We've been in the middle of a profound drought. Uh, and um, from this, we're learning a lot about um, how to be more resilient, how to be more prepared for the coming extreme events that are going to be typical as we see more impact of climate change on agriculture. So what we're going to be talking about today is ways to be more resilient. Now none of them, none of the things we suggest put you at any disadvantage when you have a perfect year. That's the nice thing. Um, a good year is just that much better. But in a difficult year, and you all have had difficult years too, if you have more diversity and more uh, practices built into your system that protects you, then the extreme weather conditions have much less impact. And so that's what we're trying to develop is a system on our farm that we can then extend to other farms and help other farmers see that you're not, you're not disadvantaging yourself with any of these ideas in the least, but you may be adding in risk management and insurance that will very well serve you if indeed climate comes off or the weather comes off um, uncertain each year. Uh, there's an interesting thing about averages that they don't tell you very much. So last year, 2015, at our farm, we had heavy flooding through May and June. And then it totally stopped raining. And it stopped raining until just a little while ago, for more than a year and a half, that we were way below normal rain. And when you get that kind of conditions, growing corn is rather tough. It doesn't like being flooded in May, and it certainly doesn't like not having any rain the rest of the summer. Uh, I saw soybeans at the Cornell Research Farm that was no-till in rolled down rye, this was in July, that were three inches tall. There was just zero water in the soil. And there were, uh, no-till crops were an absolute disaster all across New York because there was just no water for the no-till. They tell us no-till helps in a drought. When you have a drought like that, no-till is worse, at least in our area. And yet, farmers made a living, and some things worked, some things worked really well. So we're hoping that we can share some of uh, those strategies with you. Uh, one overall piece that we take, took home from it was that the more diversity we have and the more intensively we farm, the more resilient we are to bad weather. This is a uh, map put out by the um, you, uh, you, NOAA, the, the National Weather, um, just right now. Uh, this is a current picture of conditions, rainfall conditions throughout the country. And one of the things that I see here is um, the new normal is not normal. Um, if you look at the white being what is considered normal for an area, um, we, very little of the United States is normal right now. It's either way wet or way dry. And uh, what is interesting is to look at also data put out by National Weather um, about the drought monitor. They, they, they put online a drought monitor map every other week. And that was, the one on the top was the drought uh, in 2015, in the middle of August of 2015. This was 2016. You all had the drought, the Midwest had the drought last year. If you look here, up here, that's us. We're in the Finger Lakes area of upstate New York. We're equidistant between Rochester, Syracuse, and Elmira, um, about an uh, hour and a half south of Lake Ontario. And uh, we were, uh, all of western New York was extremely dry. Um, California was even worse. 
And by August, you were seeing the effect of the drought in the southern states. This is currently what it looks like, and that's why North Carolina is burning in the mountains. It has gotten so dry in North Carolina, Tennessee, and Georgia, and South Carolina, that there are spontaneous wildfires throughout uh, that area, and air quality in North Carolina is now considered um, uh, inadequate in 13 mountain ca uh, counties. So they better not breathe there. So they better not breathe there. But um, th this, again, it just shows that we have got some real extreme conditions going on in a lot of parts in the country. We tend to only look out the window and see what's going on around us. But the fact is, is that uh, these extreme conditions are increasing and they're going to increase uh, more rapidly in a lot of places. And, and that brown dot over us in New York, uh, to add insult to injury, that included, we had six inches of rain come the end of October when it was too late to do any good. So that really messed up harvest. And that six inches is averaged into that brown dot. So that's how dry we were. And yet it was possible to grow some things but corn and soybeans were not a very profitable crop. In fact, everybody that grew corn and soybeans last year conventionally lost their shirt in our state. Last year being this year. This year, yeah. <laughs> um, so so the, the, the trick is um, to plan ahead so that we build in these practices that make us more resilient um, and make us more proactive rather than constantly reacting to stuff on our farms. It's really easy to um, panic and to do things kind of in a crisis mode, which isn't necessarily either going to make us money or uh, be the right thing for our farms. It's much better to think these things through ahead and be proactive in our approaches. But if we have to be, pre pro be reactive to certain situ situations, to do so in a way that we have planned them out ahead of time. So we react in a uh, intelligent, measured kind of way. Uh, that is effective. So the different things that make our farm more resilient overall, the most important one is soil health. And I've been asked to be part of the Soil Health Institute, which is a new effort. Farmers all across the United States are suddenly noticing that their soil doesn't perform the way it used to. And I'm sure a lot of you remember some old acres uh, articles that mention that when you double organic matter, you quadruple water holding capacity. The only piece missing is nobody seems to know how to double organic matter reliably. We found some research since then, it was actually old research, Akers translated a book and I would recommend it to anyone. It was written by Margaret Sakara, and I think it was published in the very early 1960s. And this was written by a researcher who studied soil very intensively. He took a shovel, and this was actually his wife did the publishing. He died relatively early. But he'd take a shovel and he'd take samples of soil and he stained it and he looked at it under the best microscopes they had at the time and he was trying to understand what makes the soil work. And there was an important concept that I take away from that book that we have been mistaught and I think we've been working under wrong assumptions at least all of my life. And that's, we look at soil as bricks and mortar. We've got those particles of sand, silt, and clay, and they're glued together into stable aggregates by these glues that plants made. And it kind of sounds like a house or a barn. What Sakara showed was that the soil is actually being held together by living organisms. That the water holding capacity is more the result of biology than the residue of biology. And it's an active thing. And in a few of the trials, and I'll, I'll share them with you because they're really, they really stretch our understanding of soil. He took a sample of extremely well aggregated soil that was, had a cover crop on it. And the aggregate stability was in the high 60s or 70s when he did the slake test. And he left that sample of soil in the lab at about 70 degrees for two months ran the test again, and it totally fell apart. He'd lost his entire aggregate stability. Did the same sample, and he treated it with an antibiotic, or I think he used an herbicide. And that sample fell apart instantly. And what he found in, under the microscope was 
this whole structure of soil of micropores, macropores, and passages was being colonized and reinforced by living organisms that were building up the walls. And they were actually actively creating aggregates and holding them together. What these organisms lived on, though, was the exudates from the roots. It's not the green stuff we plowed down, as we used to assume, but actually the, the living plants giving off sugars from the roots. And those sugars are what fueled that active organization that was building the soil's ability to hold water. In his experiments, he showed that very good soils could hold about six inches of water in the active part that we farm. And that's if you did a really good job. And he was able to increase it to 16 inches by using cut, focused cover crops, especially crops, and he was studying them for what effect do the roots have on this aggregation. He was not asking what gives us the most fancy top. And Mary Hall will show you some pictures a little later that show really fancy growth on top. But he said that's not always indicative of what's happening underneath. And what determines our soil's productivity and health is more what's happening underneath than what we're seeing on top. The, the top is more the result of things. We have a friend up in Ontario named Ann. Um, Ann? Uh, Clark. <laughs> Clark, yes. yes. She's a professor at I'm usually the one that first names. <laughs> University of Guelph. And she is a pasture management uh, specialist. Uh, she is someone who thinks that no farm is complete without cows. And at the time we first met her, we were in a um, uh, um, break from cows. Um, we have since gone back to them because, you know, once you've got cows, you can't stay away from them. However, um, we had this long discussion with her about um, the importance of animals on a farm, uh, to cycle nutrients, to add diversity to the farm. And we argued that to her, and we still agree, we too tend our livestock very, very carefully. We feed them, we, we care for them, we try very hard to give them good conditions. They're just really, really small. And I think we, feed, we need, we organic farmers really need to think about the life in our soil as if it was our livestock, as if it was our cows. To tend them as carefully, to be as aware of their surroundings and their needs as if they were livestock we could actually see. Because if we do that, then we realize soil health, and this is something you've probably seen before, soil health is a combination, an intersection of the physical characteristics of soil, the chemical characteristics of soil, and the biological. <laughs> it's it's the, the intersection of all three when they come together in balance and are healthy that we have a good, productive, healthy soil. However, what we have learned is the greatest of those three is biological. Yeah. Yeah, we had a group from Cornell came out this spring and did some soil health tests. And this is one of the big things the Soil Health Institute is promoting, is not just to test soil for fertility, for the chemicals, but also to start measuring what are the limitations to yield that might be physical or biological or outside of just the fertilizer. And quite often, we're doing such a good job with fertility that our limiting, most limiting factor for the next crop that we're growing is actually something else. And these newer tests are helping to identify what might be your most limiting factor. Again, the problem is they can identify it, but we haven't figured out yet exactly what is the best way to treat it. And I think what our difficulty is that we like to farm reactively. We always want to buy a product. We can, when we see that we're low in phosphorus, we can buy phosphorus and put it on. But if we're low in soil structure, we can't buy soil structure and pour it on the field. But what they found early on uh, when they pulled that test, and this was just after the snow melted, was that our agri stability, and this was in a field where you could look at it and know that it was healthy soil, was poor. And one of the professors at Cornell who's been really promoting no-till, yuck, 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 that organic soil really had pretty poor agri stability, didn't it? It must be no-till is what you need instead. And I said, wait a minute, let's do this test in a month. And they were very reluctant to do the test again. They said, we've already got the results, why would we look at it again? So they came back and did it a month later, and we had terrific agri stability. 
what had happened was the cover crop, the clover that was growing there, had not been feeding over the winter the construction crew. That's my theory. At least that's, and that fits what we saw. But a month after this cover crop was greening up, the aggregate stability had been restored. And the Sakara, and this is going back to uh, some of the guesses and observations that Sakara made, was that any time that the soil doesn't have something actively growing in it that is giving off this food for the microbes in the soil that build the soil structure, they're starving and they're not working. And if you go long enough, they die and you have to reestablish them. And that's a cycle that, especially in the Corn Belt, uh, we've got this land for 12 months of the year and have something there feeding the microbes for maybe four months of it. In fact, we spend a fair amount of time and money buying chemicals to make sure those late season weeds don't move in, which if you looked at some of the old writing, Dr. Albrecht wrote about the essential services that the weeds at the end of the season provided in the crop. So when we think about biological activity in a soil and then think about the whole process of an herbicide like uh, Roundup, which is a strong biocide that does kill off a great deal of the soil life. The short-sightedness of seeing this as a way of building soil health becomes apparent, but that's a different topic. Um, we're organic farmers, we don't talk about Roundup. Um, so to go on from this though, thinking about soil physical, chemical, and biological, what we advise people when they're thinking about how to build a healthy soil is this. First, start thinking about the big stuff. You know, do you need to improve drainage? For in, in New, upstate New York, almost all the soil needs additional drainage. It's a very rare farm, farm that doesn't need additional tile drainage. But it's the big things. It's the big things that change the, the way water works, the way erosion and water infiltration works. Then looking at how to improve rapidly cycling biological material to improve the biology. And then looking at what do I buy. I sit at my desk at Lakeview um, and answer questions. And all spring, very often for new organic farmers, I get two questions. One is, what do I buy for soil fertility? And what do I buy for weed control? And those were two questions we asked when we first started out too. But it isn't, the answer isn't what we buy, it's what we do. Because you can buy all the, the especially the bugs on the jug kind of uh, fertility amendments and um, other perfectly good ones like lime and gypsum. But if you haven't taken care of the other things first, you're not going to get as much good out of your investment. And so, yes, sometimes it's really important to supplement nutrients in the soil but often you can get away with using less or making, getting more good out of what you do invest in if you take care of the biology and the physical structure first. The, going back to this idea of keeping something living in the soil as much of the year as possible, uh, this gives us some hints as to what to do for soil health. So I believe anything that keeps the ground covered is going to have some benefit, even though uh, I have to back up and admit this year where we had cover crops like the rolled rye growing ahead of soybeans, we had a, a disaster because the cover crop had used up all of the water. In fact, Cornell in their organic trials had one field, and the Cornell Research Farm had a four inch rain in August that we didn't get, but other than that, they had pretty similar weather to us. They had one field that made 180 bushel organic corn in the drought it was the one that had no cover crop and was just fertilized. <laughs> and I, th I would warn you, don't take that home as an uh, indication of how we farm. This, uh, this is an example of always farming by last year's variables. You know, that, that might have been a good idea for that one year. But that question? Oh, the qu question was, what, what did we mean by the term biotill? Okay, if you have, tillage is something that breaks the soil up and loosens it, makes it more hospitable for roots and makes it you know, better for plants to grow in. It also 
disturbs it in a way that uh, stimulates biological activity, lets air in, you know, and lets it breathe out the other materials. So we can do that with iron, with machinery, or we can have earthworms do it for us, or we can have other of the soil organisms do it. So to me, biotillage is the action of roots that break the soil up, the action of any organism that will open the soil, allow it to breathe, and uh, break it up uh, to stimulate biological activity. Think of the effect of a tillage radish, a, a, a tillage radish planted in fairly loose soil. That is going to be biotilling because it's going to break the soil up, much as if you were plowing it. We like showing pictures of our neighbors' farms because ordinarily, our, we, we, you know, the, the, the disasters they have are, are a lot more attractive than the ones we have. However, at least um, they're more fun to think about. <laughs> this was one of our disasters. Uh, back in the early '90s, um, we had a field that was uh, a hill, and it was farmed um, up and down rows, uh, north south, uh, and uh, we had a heavy rain, eight inches in one night and all of the dry, dry beans, all the red kidney bean plants ended up down here at the bottom of the hill and the water ended up going over the road and we had enormous erosion. There were two kids in a rowboat out in that field the next morning. This took a few days before she took the picture. This was a wake up call and this was just at the beginning of our organic uh, experience. We had not done a lot on the farm to improve the farm. We were still young and poor and did not have money for doing a lot of uh, the soil improvement, the, the land improvement. But we worked with NRCS, got cost-sharing money, turned all the fields 90 degrees so they were no longer uh, going up and down the hill, but instead on the contour. Um, turned it into strip crop, strip, strips of crops so that we had alternating sod crops and row crops, uh, and, and also put in diversion ditches and sod waterways. And, and now the, field, the farm looks more like this. It's much more productive. We save our soil. Uh, we've been able to build organic matter. We have a lot less damage. Um, sometimes a major project like this is, is really what you need to make your farm more resilient. Now when we get heavy rain uh, events, and we did have one in 2014, we had no erosion at all. Well, we, we might have had a little soil loss, but very little. But uh, let's flip to the next picture. Uh, the picture on the left, that's a friend of mine who's taller than I am. And this was no-till soybeans. And to quote Ray Archuleta, you, some of you probably know who Ray is. Ray likes to say, we don't have a filtration problem, we have an infiltration problem in most, most of the country. And that is this, the rain hits the soil and instead of soaking in and being stored, it's running off and causing erosion. And where Tom is standing in that, I think that was about a 10 and a half foot gully, the soil was not absorbing the water. Now our son Peter has a farm just about a mile from there that you couldn't see any soil loss. And it was in the same event. This, this was a violent storm. The village of Penyan, a building was taken down. Uh, there was, uh, our feed truck was, <laughs> our feed truck woke somebody up. It might've saved his life because the truck bumped into his upstairs bedroom window. It was floating. It, and it, it came down on top of somebody's boat. SUV when the water went down. <laughs> but more importantly, I, I took this picture um, from one of the, the overlooks and the day after the flood. And I had a friend who went out in a boat that day. And he said, you could go out in the lake. And there, there were these rivers running through the lake that were um, brown water. It was mud. It was, it was topsoil. It was all the soil that had washed down off the, the fields that were up on the, on the bluff. And so it takes, it takes centuries to build topsoil. In the course of one night, inches and inches and inches were lost from Yates County. This is a major loss. This is something that if we farmed differently, unfortunately it occurred in May, so a lot of the fields had just been plowed. But the amount of erosion and soil loss that we experienced was enormous. But there's another factor. Downtown Penyan, all the basements, all the stores were filled with flood mud. And I don't know if you've ever had to clean up after flood mud, but it is, yeah. it is kind of like mucus. It's gross. But <laughs> that, that flood mud came from somewhere. The mud that ended up in the basement of Jim's store came from Gary's field. 
And I think we as farmers have to take responsibility for the fact that if we don't farm in a way that prevents erosion and there is a flood event and there is damage to other people's property, you know, we could have done something to make it less. And if we, did, if we don't, then we're not being responsible farmers. Flip that ahead. Another topic. So the crop rotations give us the opportunity to change our system. You know, we pay taxes on our land 12 months out of the year, and a lot of us try to use it for three or four months of that time. How efficient is that, especially when land is expensive? And especially when we've realized that it's actually degrading while it's not working. Uh, Jeff Moyer, our friend at Rodale, uh, this is digressing, but it's, I think it's a good analogy. He said they were trying to get people to put in manure storages, and there was some Amish farmers in near Rodale, and they just couldn't get them to put in manure storage. And finally, Jeff went over and talked to his neighbor, and he said, well, why don't you want to put the manure storage in? And he said, well, that's the only work I have for the horses to do all winter, and if they don't work in the wintertime, they're not strong enough in the spring, and I can't get enough work out of them. And Jeff saw that as an analogy to his soil. If we don't have the soil working through the winter, it's out of shape and we can't bring it up to speed. So we have opportunities to be planting different species on our farm all through the year, except for a very short part of the winter time. And we can build crop rotations and cropping systems that fill the holes when the soil would normally be bare. We also have more than just two crops that are profitable since we're organic farmers. The biggest gift that Mary Hall and I got when we first started farming organically was that we suddenly had profitable markets for almost anything we wanted to grow instead of only being able to grow the program crops that we could get subsidies on to at a profit. You know, I used to quip that we knew that our farm was in better shape if we grew rye and oats, but growing rye and oats conventionally back in the 80s was only marginally more profitable than just mowing them down or dumping them in the gully. We didn't make any money on those crops. And that's why so much of our land was always growing corn and soybeans. But since we can make money on these other crops, and those crops are planted at different times, harvested at different times, we can actually uh, make better use of our labor and we're not as exposed to the risk of extreme weather because we won't have our entire farm wiped out if we have weather that destroys the corn and soybean crop. In fact, even this year with the worst drought in anyone's memory, our spelt crop, our wheat crop, our rye crop, all of our grain crops were above average, which was over half of our land. And incidentally, much of that land we turned right around and double cropped it after we harvested the grain, we planted another crop in the dry weather, and we'll get into some of the details of that a little later. Last year, last fall about this time, I sat down with um, Claus and our son Peter, and I said, okay, what all did we grow this year? And we kept adding things to the list. Um, this is what, and I tweaked it a little bit for what we grew this year, and I think it's important to see that um, diversity is risk management. We have been able to overcome the, the biggest risks we had as far as markets, as far as weather, um, crop failures, disease, uh, by having a lot more diversity. Of course we've got corn and soybeans and, and hay and, and wheat. Um, those are kind of the core of our business. But we have a lot of other things too. And so, um, you all want to keep reading? I mean, it's fun. It's, it's fun to go through all these different things that we do because uh, in the bottom are the things that we, we raise for our own, own food needs. Uh, we don't buy much in the way of food. And, and that's part of the fun of, of farming is that you don't have to. You can, you can raise every, pretty much all you eat. Yeah, we, we sometimes amuse ourselves thinking, what are the people that, you know, they have those cards when you go to the store and they track what you buy? And they must think we only buy toilet paper and dog food sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great diet. But what's important is to see that for organic farmers, there is a lot of opportunity for diversity. And it's important to look at the different crops that, are, are, that we have markets for, that we do have the opportunity to grow as 
far as where we can plug them into our crop rotation. What we try to do is to have something growing, something harvested, and something being planted at most months during the year. You know, there are a few months in upstate New York we're not harvesting, obviously. But at this point here in November, we have got over a third of our farm planted. Uh, over half. Over half this year? Okay. Yeah. Two wheat, rye, uh, barley, spelt. Uh, and all of those uh, grain crops are now going to be pretty much on autopilot until next August, next July and August, when we harvest them. This spreads out our workload. We're not trying to row crop everything, all 1,500 acres in, in the spring. Um, it also spreads out the risk because the grain crops will be growing through, through a time when we generally have adequate moisture. But it does give us a lot of ideas of, well, if we have a month window when we don't have anything growing, between the time we harvest the oats and the time we plant the, uh, the fall grain, what can we put in there? The repertoire is large. We can stick a, a crop of um, buckwheat in. We could stick a, a crop of BMR Sorghum Sudan in for a short period of time. Looking at our whole farm, whole cropping system as, as sort of a, a, a picture, a, a, a painting, where we can fill in different colors here and there throughout the year, has given us a great deal of opportunity to diversify our crops, but also diversify our markets. So this spring, between the 26th of May and the 26th of July, we had less than an inch of rain total in the 60 days, and we had temperatures in the 90s most days. You can guess we had some crops that failed. And we took those fields, we had some soybeans, and they were, a, they were actually a very difficult to grow type of soybean. They were high in sugar, and something that's little known, unless you've grown the high sugar sweet corns, is that when it's very dry and you've got a high sugar plant, penicillium will destroy the seed. So we actually had soybeans that were destroyed in this dry ground by penicillium. And we came back immediately a no-tilled BMR sorghum sedan grass because we knew there was going to be a forage crisis. The hay crops, and with that little rain, the hay crops don't yield. With that little rain, corn silage doesn't yield. You know, there were, we knew that cow, the pastures had already dried up and people were feeding winter feed. So all of our grain crops, as they were harvested, we followed them, unless they had clover that was strong enough in them, we followed them immediately with uh, BMR sorghum sedan grass. And in fact, some of those fields of BMR sorghum sedan that we either double cropped or put in after a failed crop yielded higher than the corn silage that most people chopped in our neighborhood did this fall. And it was actually better quality feed. And this is something, uh, I think Albert Lee is probably the only place that has some of these seeds this year. But the BMR6 gene makes the lignin and the fiber much more digestible than it is in the, in the normal version of that crop. And if you get a forage analysis on BMR sorghum sedan, it's going to be wrong. Uh, there is a consultant in New York, Tom Kilser, and he's watched animal performance feeding uh, different crops and he said if you've got BMR sorghum sedan that tests 60 and you've got corn silage that tests 72 you're going to get more milk out of the BMR sorghum sedan that has a 60 NEL because this, the analysis is wrong. They don't they haven't got the calibration down to get the analysis right on that and they just haven't worked long enough yet to give you an accurate test but we put up uh, I think it was 900 feet of ag bag this year that was full of BMR sorghum sedan. Some of it was just BMR sedan grass. When it got later, we planted some uh, BMR pearl millet. Now, these were all crops that can grow with so much less water, and they come up with a lot less rain. This is some pure science that you may remember from high school biology, or you may not. Um, some, some of you may have run into the difference between C, C3 plants and C4 plants. Um, and it's, it's, it's a, it's the, the biology behind it has to do with the way photosynthesis works. Photosynthesis is, it, the, the older version of photosynthesis is the C3 type. And it turns carbon dioxide, or it, it, 
it turns carbon dioxide and, and, and sunlight into uh, sugars and oxygen, but it does so in a fairly um, wasteful way. Uh, it, it needs a lot of water in order to do that. Um, which, if, if the plants are growing in a uh, plenty, plenty of water, if it's, if it's not in, limita in limited form, and if it's not excessively hot, C3 uh, type of photosynthesis is very productive. But when you get into an arid condition, or into midsummer in upstate New York, where the temperature is high and the water is increasingly limited, the C3 plants, the things like beans, rice, wheat, um, rye, barley, cotton, potatoes, oats, don't do particularly well. They tend to go fairly dormant if they haven't finished up their cycle. C4 plants are a newer uh, form of photosynthesis, and they need a lot less water to produce the same amount of sugar. And so we're looking at these C4 plants as being a new opportunity for, for where we are to fill in that gap during the summer. And this is where we see the sorghum, millet, sorghum Sudan. These types of plants do very well when it is very hot and when it is dry. Just knowing the biology helps us to plan our crop rotations and make better use of the conditions. Corn is a C4 crop, but it's not one that makes as efficient use as some of the other ones of, of water. But the other thing, if you noticed on there, it talked about uh, the C3 plants need about 200 parts per million of carbon dioxide. When I, was in high when I was in elementary school, our atmosphere was probably about 270 parts per million carbon dioxide. Today, it's well above 400 parts per million, which further gives the C4 plants an advantage when you're dry over the C3s. When we were first talking to Ilya about putting together this talk, he said, why don't you talk about specialty grains? And you'll know why in just a moment. Um, we do grow a lot of specialty crops that are for unique markets. Um, we're growing Frederick, which is a soft white winter wheat for an artisan um, milling um, flour market that the big, um, or the big grocery store chain called Wegmans in the Northeast is making some of a, a line of artisan breads and you, trying to use local grains and they found that the Frederick wheat just works really good in a lot of their breads. So we're growing those. We're growing sunflowers for oil, for little, little bottles of artisan oil that were featured last week in the New York Times as being the thing to have on your Thanksgiving table this year. Um, we're growing cabbage for sauerkraut. Well, this has been a bust this year. Cabbage needs water and it also likes cooler temperatures. So it did not grow very well, but it did adequately. But the six inches of rain came in time to make a real mess when we tried to harvest it. And, and make the, <laughs> the head split. And then we're also doing some of the heritage older uh, type wheats, einkorn and emmer. And um, Ilya happened to be there on, uh, in, in August for uh, the kosher spelt, kosher einkorn harvest. Now talk about specialty crops. You know, we had all these Hasidic <laughs> rabbis there, dueling rabbis. Uh, one group from Brooklyn and one group from Toronto came down to supervise the harvest. And they don't necessarily agree on a lot of things, nor are they, should they be in the same field at the same time. Uh, we hadn't had rain for months. And wouldn't you know, it rained that day. Uh, just about a hundredth of an inch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the the, the take-home message here is specialty crops specialty grains for some of the emerging markets can be very profitable. They can be a lot of fun. They can put you in touch with some truly interesting people. But each level of specialtiness has its own quality specs, has its own requirements, has, may ha need its own equipment. Each time you make a little bit more on a premium specialty market, it's going to require more of you. And that's just the bottom line. It's not for everyone to do specialty grains. It is a lot of work to do some of these things. It's fun, and it can be profitable. It can be remarkably unprofitable. But it does um, add a level of diversity and uh, color to a farm that uh, corn and soybeans just never will give. Emmer is actually the ancient grain of Israel that de uh, developed in the Middle East. 
and it's extremely drought tolerant. It has a much stronger root system than wheat does. And that's probably one reason that uh, Russian immigrants to North Dakota brought their emmer with them, and it was very well adapted to the arid regions of North Dakota. They, they were using it for cattle feed, and it has a persistent gloom, so you can't just use it. We happen to have a spelt dehauler, which also can be used for dehauling emmer. And that is one of these crops that can take extreme weather conditions, just because that's where it came from. Modern wheat was actually an accidental, uh, the result of an accidental cross between a wild grass and emmer. That's a story that most people don't know. Uh, emmer is a tetraploid. It has um, four of each chromosome. And when it crossed accidentally with this wild grass, it became an, uh, what they call an autohexaploid. It actually has six for each, uh, six copies of each chromosome, but from different sources. And modern wheat has a relatively weak root system because it's been selected for very high fertility, high yield conditions, better soils, and it's not nearly as hardy or as resilient as the mother uh, grain that was grown there. But it, now we're finding that there's demand for it because a lot of the Hasidic Jewish people have an intolerance to modern wheat. They get sick. And the rest of this story is that they have to eat matzah during Passover. That would be like not taking the bread with communion if you don't. And uh, they have this unpleasant choice between having severe gastric distress and diarrhea or not following the religious requirement. And at one point, about 30, 40 years ago, a Jewish grandmother said, well, couldn't we use some of the old grains? And they found that the people could eat the, that had this uh, digestive problem could go back and eat spelt or emmer for the Passover, and, that, and everything was fine. And the rabbis agreed that that would satisfy the requirement. But that's just an interesting story behind a niche for something that uh, had been used for cattle feed for a long time. So now we're going to talk a little bit about cover cropping. Um, cover cropping is uh, very much in the news right now. Um, I, you can't pick up a farm magazine um, and not read an article about cover crops. And it is, it is good. I mean, anything that adds diversity is good. I'm not going to uh, say that it's not a good idea to encourage our conventional neighbors to cover crop. I do think that it, it isn't the band-aid that it's being presented as. Um, but we can certainly point to a whole lot of good things that adding another crop in, especially at a time when the main crops are not there, um, is going to provide nitrogen, add organic matter, resist erosion, um, in increase um, in infiltration, break up weed cycles. All of those things are good. As organic farmers, of course we need to use cover crops, but we can end up using them a lot more creatively than often we're told. Uh, and so when I talk to our, the farmers who call looking for seed and they ask, well, well, what can I use for a cover crop? What I try to do is to guide them through some questions as far as where they want to plug the cover crop in. Or, you know, this fall, I have a lot of vegetable farmers, a lot of uh, CSA type small vegetable farmers. And uh, they want to put something in. So they, just, they, they know that they should be cover cropping, but they don't necessarily know how it's going to impact them through the fall and then fall the coming year. So asking questions about, do you want something that's going to winter kill, or do you want something that'll be there in the spring? Do you want something that uh, you can broadcast, or do you have the equipment to actually plant it? Do you, do you know the value of a legume, or do you, want, do you want something that's going to be just a grass? Or how about a crop mixture? Uh, we organic farmers can do that. We don't have herbicide carryover. Uh, and so what we try to do is to talk farmers through answering the questions themselves. Don't, don't necessarily do what we're doing on our farm. Don't use our farm necessarily as a template. We try out a lot of things. We do act sort of like a, a research farm and then use Lakeview Organic Grain as an extension service to teach people what we learn. But uh, we, th we, we really feel it's important for farmers to define for themselves what's going to fit on their farms. And by doing that, they need to answer a series of questions. So I share with you a story from about two years ago of 
two cover crop mixtures. You know, you've probably all heard of Gabe Brown in North Dakota. He does a really terrific job of no-tilling. And Ray Archuleta had a picture from, I think it was 2012 when they had a severe drought where he had 12 different cover crops in a mixture growing in a field. And when he crimped it down, there was enough water so that he had a decent corn crop. And yet each of those cover crop species by itself planted in a test plot died because it ran out of water. Now the backstory on that is that researchers have since figured out that the mycorrhizae and the fungal network around those roots was actually taking the water from the deep-rooted plants and sharing it with the shallow-rooted plants. And this water was going round and round from root to root as those, different, those 12 different species cooperated and enhanced each other. Now at another meeting, uh, about that time, a little, actually about a year later, I met a f farmer from Oklahoma, Jimmy Kinder, and Jimmy was very inspired by the no-tillers in North Dakota, he'd been to Gabe Brown's, and he had, was in the spot where the dust pole started originally, and he showed us some pictures that uh, at that time he'd been in a five-year drought and he showed us a picture of round bales with soil drifts around him and he said this is in the middle of a no-till field and we've got soil drifting and we've got to do better than that. And then he showed us a picture of where he put in a cover crop mixture and then planted his wheat. And he said, I believe this is the right thing to do but I'd like someone to help me understand what went wrong. Where I planted this wheat after this cover crop mixture I only had a quarter of the yield that I did where I planted the wheat the way I normally do. And I stood there like an idiot, didn't see what I was looking at. But uh, Jill Clapperton was in the group. And she suddenly popped up her hand and she said, you know, you've got seven different species mixed here. They all have the same type of root. That kind of opened up, that was an aha moment. That it's not just any mixture, not just throwing lots more different things together, but it has to be things that help each other, things that belong together. And Jimmy had the right idea, and he had put all these tap-rooted crops together in the cover crop mix, but there weren't the fibrous-rooted plants, there weren't the shallow-rooted plants. And for some reason, those species that he had selected were not complementary in the cover crop mix, and therefore they didn't, they probably helped his soil health, but they certainly didn't help the wheat, and they didn't do what they could have, where the species that Gabe had put together must have been the right complement to make the best use of the resources, and they created an environment that favored the crop that he planted into him, which incidentally then he ran his cattle on it and harvested the cover crops as feed. That's one of the things we have learned about crop rotation. Uh, it is important to rotate our crops, but it's also important to rotate our pests. And uh, we talk about breaking up pest cycles. We can see that above ground in, in breaking up weed cycles but we don't necessarily think about underground. Um, we ran into this after we'd been very earnest, diligent organic farmers for about 10 years, planting lots of medium red clover as a, as a frost seeding into our small grains. Um, nothing wrong with it. It's a good idea. It also, there's nothing against organic standards about this. However, when you plant a lot of red clover and then soybeans and then perhaps a field of alfalfa, you're, they're all legumes. And yes, you're rotating crops, but you're not rotating pests. You're not especially rotating uh, root pests. And so we saw that as we put clover in, uh, in subsequent years, it grew less and less and less. And we couldn't quite figure out why uh, what looked like the most amazing nitrogen producer in the world uh, was starting to, to do poorly on our earnest organic farm. And we went to Cornell and talked to Dr. George Bowie, who's a plant pathologist there, and he said, think about ways to break up that, that cycle of having legumes so often. Try buckwheat. Try mustard. These are not related to legumes. They're, they're good cover crops. They do other things. They have other factors. They, they, they have other benefits. Uh, and so we have tried to add in additional cover crops, but make sure that we have sufficient diversity to break up the pest cycles. Buckwheat is great. Buckwheat is a wonderful crop that not only suppresses weed growth, 
It also releases bicarbonate ions that break down phosphorus in the soil, so the, the, chem the uh, inorganic phosphorus is turned into a form that plants can actually l use. Uh, and it also uh, has a, a negative impact on soil, soil microbes. The, the, uh, Tightenings. It, 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 it releases chitinase that breaks down the cell walls of fungi that can be um, pathogenic. This mustard I saw growing um, a couple weeks ago on a conventional farm. We usually put mustard in as a frost seeding into corn stubble and then let it grow through April and May and then plow it down in May before we plant uh, the, the next crop. And it, it does well, but it doesn't do like that. I drove by that field and I thought, wow, that's mustard. Uh, and the fact is that they put it in uh, probably after the wheat came off. Um, it's a conventional field, so probably it has a lot of free nitrogen, a lot of free nutrients there. And that mustard is, is being a fantastic fall cover crop. It will winter kill, and therefore uh, it will hold the nutrients in a biological form over the winter and then be, be dead the coming year. I used to, when I was younger, I had some neighbors that would tell me about these Italian immigrants that used to come up and work in the fields. And in fact, one of, one of them became the mayor of Syracuse. At least his parents worked in the field, but he became the mayor of a major city later. But what he said was impressed with was they'd come to the work with only a piece of bread in the lunchbox, and then they would go pick the mustard, and they would make mustard green sandwiches. Uh, mustard greens not only taste good, but they're, they're very nutritious. If you tested that field as a cattle feed, the NEL on it would be somewhere around 78 or 80. It would make corn silage look like a very poor second-rate feed. It would make alfalfa look like a poor quality feed in comparison. Now, that probably the yield of cattle feed from that mustard isn't high, but it illustrates that there are things we can grow that we hadn't thought about that could really make cattle produce a lot of milk. The other thing that that picture shows is that the length of the day, the time of year, impacts how a species grows. So if we plant oats in the spring, you get a short straw and a lot of heads, a lot of grain. If you plant that same oats in midsummer and have it grow now in the, in the short days of the fall, it'll grow enormous. It makes just a huge amount of biomass, but it makes a very, very poor grain yield. In fact, if uh, there were some forage oat varieties that you plant in the spring, there are actually oats that are designed to grow during the short days, and by growing them in the spring, they make a lot of forage. So the allocation of resources in a plant is modulated by the length of the day, and we can use that to advantage. If we plant these spring oats in the fall, they just make a lot more biomass and they're not going to make grain, but we're not able to harvest the grain then. The mustard is doing the same thing. The mustard is allocating a lot more resources into producing the biomass when it's growing during those short days. And incidentally, uh, there, along with the concept of C3 and three, C4 plants, there are plants that will grow whenever the temperature is above 34 degrees. Things like annual ryegrass will actually grow and fix carbon and produce biomass in temperatures below 40. And that's another way that we can use more of the season because they're, the C4 crops, most of them, have, when it's below 65 degrees Fahrenheit soil temperature, they're not growing, it's too cold. Where annual ryegrass is happiest below that temperature. But the whole, yes, to your question. He's asking whether we're concerned <laughs> about volunteer mustard seed. That is a question that our neighbors ask us every year. The answer is no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the variety we're using, we actually get from Albert Lee, and it's a culinary variety. It doesn't have hard seed. The reason mustard is such a weed is that it produces hard seed that can lay in the ground until the conditions are right for it to grow, and it can stay there for years. But this cultivated mustard doesn't have hard seed. It, uh, the seeds all grow right away. But beyond that, I, I told, about, told this story in Aberdeen uh, South Dakota once, and a farmer came up afterwards and he said, you know, you just answered a question. And I, it, I went into more detail. But he said, you know, I had a field that was so heavy mustard and it kept getting worse every year. And finally, the field, I planted it to oats and it came up all mustard and I plowed it under and I never saw mustard there again. 
Well, the mustard was growing in those fields because the conditions favored mustard over other species. And what I've observed is that you can watch what weeds grow and what your field is doing as an indication of what the soil condition is and which species would grow best. So what he did when he plowed the mustard under, the mustard actually changed the soil condition and corrected what was making the mustard want to grow. When, before we started using mustard as a cover crop, we had an increasing amount of mustard growing as a weed in our corn. But when we started growing it intentionally, we stopped having it become a weed. So whatever biological function that weed was serving in the, in the ecosystem, we were just deciding when we wanted it and putting it in a form that wasn't going to get away from us. The next way to make our farms more resilient is not to be an island all to ourselves. And we have been really experimenting with this um, in, a, in a pretty intensive way. Um, we want to grow more uh, cover crops. We want to grow more forages. We want to grow more uh, crops that don't necessarily have a grain market for them. But we also have to have a way of using them. And we, we are surrounded by an old water Mennonite community. Uh, many of the farms are fairly small acreage, and there are a lot of young people, because we're, we're in the, the second to third generation of population growth among this pe these people. And so there are a lot of young farmers starting out without a great deal of financial resources and without really large enough acreages to feed their cows. Um, we are working with three satellite farms, three neighboring farms right now, um, who are dairy farmers. They um, are doing a fine job with their cows, but they need a little extra help uh, to produce more feed for their cows. We wanted to be able to produce more forages. What a perfect situation. We can look beyond the boundaries of our farm and increase the opportunity to rotate by using other people's farms um, in, in conjunction with ours. And it's a really a win-win situation. Uh, there were two problems when we were looking at selling forages to people who needed more feed. And one of them I'll illustrate with a saying that I heard in Vermont, that you could buy the neighbor's farm one bale at a time. That could be either hay or straw, because the carbon and the loss of minerals from that farm were a major loss to your system. The other problem is water quality. If a dairy farm continually imports more feed than they export in minerals in the milk, the land will get richer to a point and then it will become overly rich and start polluting the water, which we have that situation in why Chesapeake Bay is essentially dead because there's just too many animals upstream and we don't have a closed nutrient cycle. So we had a neighbor in, this was in 2012, it was a severe drought. He had just gone through organic transition and he had back-to-back -back severe droughts. That's his farm. On his farm during transition, which that's a, that's a recipe for a disaster. And he kept trying to buy our cover crops from us. And I kept saying no, because I didn't want that fertility to leave our farm. And finally, I had the idea, or came to the realization that uh, we're able to help him, and he needs the help, so we have a responsibility to do something. So how do we make this work? And I looked at his farm, he already had too much fertility. He had some animal health issues, that, that's a whole other talk, that were due to having too much fertility. And I said, well, how about if we set up a deal where we supply all of the feed to your cows this winter, grain and hay both, and we get paid so much per hundredweight out of your milk check. And we get and, manure back. And we get all of the manure back. Incidentally, we'll give you a blank check for straw. You can have all the straw you want, and I'll encourage you to bed the cows deep and keep them warm and clean. And he agreed to it, and it actually turned his farm around. He went from where he was on the ropes and in danger of losing his farm to where he's now able to help other neighbors, and that was in just a matter of three years. It just, he was a good farmer to start with, so that was just a little leg up that he needed. Since then, we've had two other young farmers who couldn't afford enough land, and we set this deal up with them ahead of time, and it was, it was able, to, they were able to start their farms and begin to make payments and actually operated a profit by just paying us out of the milk check. And they didn't have to own all the machinery for producing and harvesting the forage. In fact, the first farmer 
is supplying the machinery in the wagons and he's doing a lot of the work so that the, we've become kind of a, like a threshing circle used to be. But we have the, our large land resource base is now integrated with their resource base of their cows. And we're able to produce a crop like in a good year, we can produce a crop of spelt which is profitable in itself. The straw comes off for his cows and that fall we can produce another two to three tons of dry matter top quality forage that they can make milk on. So we're actually increasing the production of our farm. We're now producing milk without having to milk cows, but without reducing the production of our fields. It's kind of, the sum is more than the whole of its parts. We also board their dry cows and their heifers because we do have pasture. And so they're using their pasture for their dairy cows, which is convenient on a small acreage. Uh, and, and then they're bringing their cows, uh, their dry cows and their heifers over to our farm. Cal, uh, Klaus gets his cow fix every day because he can go down and take care of them. And that keeps them happy. Uh, but, but we also um, can do a really good job uh, feeding the heifers and the dry cows. Too many farms that I see, uh, they, they really skimp on their dry cows and heifers. They're not the ones that are earning them profit, so they, don't, they get the, the worst quality hay, and if there's not enough of it, they don't get enough of it. Uh, this way, we know that Paul, Jim, and uh, Eric get uh, really good quality feed for their heifers and dry cows so that when they go and, and start milking, they, they hit the ground running. So, so this summer, this uh, plan kind of fell apart because it was so dry, we knew the clover wasn't going to grow anything. We had some of these, field, a few fields of beans fail that we planted the BMR sorghum sedan, but we had to figure out how are we going to feed 200 head of dairy cattle real quick. And that's why we went ahead and planted the BMR uh, sorghum sedan on more fields as a double crop. We planted the BMR pearl millet as a double crop after some other ones. And we made a lot of innovations. We also planted Austrian winter peas and um, Triticale this fall on a lot more acres than we normally would have because it will be a heavy forage crop in the middle of May next year. That'll shorten the winter and help reduce the, the crisis of having enough forage. And uh, I mentioned our no-till soybeans into rolled rye was a bust. It wasn't totally a bust. I wish I had made an adjustment quicker. What we did, we took our best land where we normally have extra rain and we went ahead with a plan with plan A. We had some very poor land where Ely has seen it. There's only four to six inches of topsoil, extremely droughty, and the rye was already shoulder high, and I knew there was no point in trying to no-till into that. We took that as forage, and that rye actually tested uh, about 70 NEL, had about 11% protein, and we pulled, I think it was about 10 or 11 tons per acre of baleage off that cover crop and we planted, came right back and planted BMR sorghum sedan on it. We ended up harvesting about 23, 24 ton per acre of forage from that field. That was our worst droughtiest land in, a, in the worst drought. Uh, there wasn't a cornfield in our county that made more than 12 ton of silage this, fall, this past fall. So that actually our worst field turned out to be our best field by doing that. So we have, when we're in a crisis like we were this year, having this diversity and having the tools that these new crops give us made it possible to turn what could have been a total disaster into what wasn't really that bad. And all, the, all three farms that we're working with now, their neighbors are all kind of envious and would love to get on the same deal with us, but we don't have enough land to handle that many cows because they're not, they've got enough feed for their cattle and they're doing well and they're not wondering how they're going to pay for the feed. We're running out of time. So we're going to go a little bit faster now through some of these slides. Um, this is barley and Austrian winter peas uh, planted in the fall. Uh, in the spring, the barley is apparent. Um, this was in May. By a week later, the Austrian winter peas were overtopping that. The coffee shop talk was a, was a blast that year. What have you done to your field of barley? Well, actually, the guys were saying, well, they did have some barley out there, but the weeds just totally destroyed it. 
Now, now, a neat thing about Austrian winter peas, they make excellent quality dairy feed. We were actually growing these as a seed crop that we were going to split and, and sell, to, especially the Austrian winter peas, because we sell a lot of them. What you're looking at was over seven feet tall. But uh, the nice thing about some of these cover crops is that you can have your cover crop and eat it too. There is nothing better than a spring salad of Austrian winter pea shoots. This is a, little, a picture of the BMR Sorghum Sudan we've been talking about. This is at Paul Horse Farm, um, and one of, the, one of the tubes he has, but that was the uh, BMR Sorghum Sudan in the, in the height of the drought. I took that in August, and it was, nothing was growing, and so that looked pretty good. Um, I have said that I've never seen BMR Sorghum Sudan wilt, but where there was only four inches of topsoil this summer, it did wilt. This is a field of BMR sorghum sedan that we did two years ago where we had some volunteer barley, Austrian winter peas, we threw in some soybeans. We did this whole succotash mix and it made really good forage for cows. Um, this is an interesting experiment that our neighbor did this year. He put in um, three species in, in August, um, the tillage radish, the purple top uh, turnips, and cowpeas. The idea of the cowpeas were to add nitrogen and also get a legume in there growing. What didn't work as well is that uh, we probably needed a more northern variety of cowpea. That's one of these things we've got to learn. We've got to find the right varieties for our conditions. This was a Georgia variety and when it started getting cooler in the fall it really stopped. But I think with a little more experimentation we can really make this whole process work. And th this has been, th this neighbor, just like everyone else, it, it was kind of hard to find things to be excited about or to make the year fun. Uh, there's a restaurant in New York City, and we're good friends with Dan Barber, and he was looking for something unique to serve, and Dan sent some of his people up, and they're paying Timmy a dollar a piece for his radishes and a dollar a piece for his turnips. They want the whole thing out, they want it washed. And they're overnighting and they want the top it. On it. <laughs> yeah, and they're sending it with a refrigerated truck, but Timmy's just having a ball selling these things. <laughs> <laughs> one, one little thing about um, radishes is that depending on the soil, you know, they can either be a really good biotiller or really not. This was our neighbor, uh, a conventional neighbor from the road. Um, they, they were really uh, showy radish plants. Uh, they looked really impressive. Um, but when you walked out in the field, three quarters of the root was sticking up. Uh, those, those look to me like a very fat man trying to pull on pants that won't go on. The, the plant, the root was all <laughs> out of the ground. <laughs> so, so you really see the difference in soil health. Okay, quickly, 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 quickly. We're, we're, we're coming, we're developing a whole concept called cultural defense. Now we're not, it's not completely fleshed out yet, but we feel that um, this is a, a lens, this is a way of thinking about our farming, of w things that we can build in, either in our process every year, or in our decision making that is kind of held in reserve depending on what nature throws at us, so that we know how to approach crises, uh, extreme weather conditions when they come. An example of this, Weed control on an organic farm in droughts. Well, we have to think a little differently. We have to keep cultivating. This was a difficult thing to do this year because nothing was growing, so neither was the weeds. And so a lot of the farmers around our area just said, eh, it doesn't matter. When the rains did come in the fall, they had a real serious weed problem. And I've got people bringing in soybeans right now that are just filled with weeds. Well, the weeds weren't there when we would ordinarily be cultivating but they sure did grow later on in the season. It was a lot of fun here just a month ago when uh, we, we participated in the USTN corn trials. And the Cornell team came out to harvest uh, our corn trial, which the yields are not going to look pretty because it was the height of the drought. But they commented that we had less weeds than any of the Roundup Ready plots they looked at. We had less weeds than anything that had been sprayed with chemicals. Now, I, I take a fair amount of pride in that plot but we had absolutely 100% perfect weed control all the way through that plot, so it can be done. When it rains all the time, we have to think differently about weed control. We have to do different things. We've got to perhaps use different equipment. And so we have to think, plan that ahead of time as far as what's going to be effective. When it rains all the time, 
like it did several years ago, then we have to think even differently about weed control and also harvesting good quality grain. I'm not going to go through all of these slides very, very carefully, but if at lunch you want to see them, I'll have them at our table. Um, harvest is really, really important when we're working in a defensive mode. Um, there are so many things that need to be thought about at harvest, but they're the big three. Have a good moisture tester that you know is calibrated and test the moisture. Prepare your storage wherever you're going to put it and make sure it's clean and make sure it's ready when you harvest. And be prepared to clean the grain afterwards if you need, once you get it harvested. Um, being both a grain grower and a grain buyer, we tend to see things very differently. Um, and we see an awful lot of people's mistakes that they think that somehow we're going to take care of for them. Um, there are a lot of things that you need to do if you are going to build good relationships with buyers, especially for specialty grains, that may involve a lot of, of your work and being prepared at harvest. And this is a real good example of being creative. Oh, I'll, yeah. turn, I'll, I'll turn that over and I'll start playing. Hey, when that six inches of rain came, uh, this really added insult to injury. It didn't just mess up our cabbage fields. We had planted 168 acres of dry beans, and I don't know how many of you have grown kidney beans, but they have to be pulled. They can't be clipped with a regular combine. In fact, if you use a rotary, it'll make them unsellable. So uh, we could not get across the fields. The rain came a day after we started pulling beans. And this crop, dry beans are very tolerant of dry weather. They're actually a really good crop. We had about $200,000 out in the field and we couldn't begin to harvest. And what we did to address that problem, uh, other than take some Alka-Seltzer, because it really does make you sick, we, uh, we tried something off the wall. We actually had an employee who suggested it. He had worked for uh, a company that picked snap beans. And he said, I think a snap bean picker would work to pick the pods off those dry beans. And I found somebody that had a snap bean picker and he came out that wasn't doing anything because it was after the season. And we found that we could pick those pods off the plants even in the deepest mud and do a good job. And we were actually getting less fuel loss than we had been with our puller. And then we brought them back to the barnyard. And that's what this video shows. We, we, we set up this Rube Goldberg machine that... The, the snap bean picker had a dump box which was dumping onto the truck. We had one man full time hauling beans and we don't have a picture of the pile, but that's, that's part of the pod pile. And we've got a telehandler with a 10 meter extension and this pod pile was pushed as high as the telehandler would push it. But we managed to get our beans harvested. But when we let the cows out, this is the barnyard, instead of heading to the pasture, they were all heading for that pile and sticking their noses in it. Who'd have thunk that cows liked dry bean pods? Now the, there were beans that were not fully threshed out, and those beans are 22% protein with a very high energy, and they incidentally caused the cows to have kind of diarrhea from too much protein. <laughs> but the pods, and we looked in, I looked up, uh, there's nothing online, but Morrison's Feeds and Feeding, one of the additions from the 50s, they had analyzed, and there was a comment in there saying, in, in regions that grow dry beans, Farmers will use pods to feed cattle. Now this goes back to when people used to pull the beans, put them in the barn, let them get dry, and then thresh them with a threshing machine. And they were considered a valuable cattle feed. They have a TDN of around 50, and the cattle just absolutely love those things. So we ended up with a haystack in a year when the crops are short. And I'm really glad to have that haystack coming into the winter. The final topic. <laughs> Can we hold questions for just a moment? Because um, we've got to get through all of this. Um, is, is, is really because we have a 28-year-old son who's moving into the business and who's doing a lot of the work. Um, organic farming was our dream. It was our frontier. It was what we pioneered. It was the, 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 the nut we cracked. But if we want our children to also move into the business and feel inspired by it, they need their own frontiers. They need their own nuts to crack. And for Peter, uh, his is really figuring out how to fit technology into the farm um, in a way that makes us better organic farmers, that makes us more energy independent, 
that makes our ability to adapt to ch ch changing conditions more effective. He's uh, worked with GPS companies to correct the, the GPS signals and make them uh, work better on our farm. But we've put solar panels on pretty much all of our, our barn roofs so that at this point, the stationary energy, the non-mobile energy on our farm is pretty much all being generated by the sun. Now, you know, we have grain dryers, we have a soybean roaster, we have uh, a spelt dehiller. We, we go through a great deal of energy on our farm. And most of it at this point that isn't a mobile type of energy is being fueled by the sun. We have to think about ways to move our farms into the next generation and beyond. We organic farmers are doing a lot of good stuff, but we are still heavily dependent on petroleum. And if we cannot find ways to wean ourselves off of petroleum and find ways to make our energy less something we have to buy, uh, our children are going to be frustrated. We were really good organic farmers once, but they may not be able to continue doing this. Now, we had an employee who frustrated me. I don't think anyone here ever had that. But uh, he was much bigger around than I am, and he had to drive this three-quarter ton farm repair truck to the coffee shop every day for his coffee and added inches around his middle. And it really bugged me to spend 50 cents a mile to have him driving. So I got rid of the truck, and we had the solar panels, and I got an electric plug-in vehicle. Little smart car. <laughs> <laughs> Robert couldn't fit into it. <laughs> but we do use that on the farm. We now have two plug-in electric vehicles. It costs about three cents a mile to uh, produce the electricity that those cars use. Uh, what we need is a pickup truck that will run that way. And in Europe, you can now buy telehandlers then they're, they're really good for inside barns because cattle don't like the noise of a car and you don't really want the sparks in a building. And Merlot builds a telehandler now that has a four hour battery pack that has a diesel engine that will start when it runs out, but for most operations it can be run that way. I think we're on the cusp of a major change in technology. With variable frequency drives, with the battery technology we have now, and also with the cost of solar where it is now. Uh, it's actually cheaper, potentially, already to be using renewable energy from the sun than it is to buy fuel for a lot of jobs. It's not practical for everything, but it's amazing how fast this technology is coming. And I think organic farmers ought to be the ones who show the way on that. To finish up, um, the nice thing is, is that we know where the end of the rainbow is, um, and probably you all do too. And I think it's really important to share that with our neighbors, our children. Farmers have a tendency to complain, and if they don't have something to complain about, they don't seem to have a reason to talk. I think it's very important for us to be grateful for the amazing opportunities we have, uh, and the amazing um, place we are right now in a market that rewards organic farming, that really wants the products that we want to grow, and who, who admires us as farmers because we are trying to do something good. Enjoy it. Be there in the presence of being doing something good. It's important. We have written a lot of articles about weed control, soil fertility manage, management, Yoni's disease, uh, worms in cows, anything you might possibly want to think about. If somebody calls up and asks us a question at Lakeview about a topic, we'll try to write an article about it. And we do have them mostly uh, posted up there at the Lakeview Organic Grain website under the info button. This talk will be turned into an Acres uh, article probably within the next six months. Um, I'm just trying to pull, pull it all together. Um, but that is one place you can get more information. And so we're done. Any questions? You had one. Did, are there any questions? Yes, sir. You feel that the, the biology in the soil dies or goes dormant? When? 
Uh, the individual organisms die, but the biology is still there if we haven't killed it. But it won't, it stops working though until it gets food again. Okay, so it goes dormant. Yeah, but, yes. the, but the individual organisms do die. You know, there's just enough, stay, enough of them stay dormant for it to rebloom. And, and many of their activities that we count on do go dormant. We, we had a SARE grant um, about 10 years ago where we sampled soil every six weeks for two years um, to track uh, the cycling of nutrients in the soil. And also to get a better idea of when is the best time to take a soil test. When we took soil tests in February when it was cold and wet, our phosphorus was very, very low. On those same fields, when we took new samples in June, the phosphorus was moderate to high. And it, it wasn't that suddenly over six months we put any phosphorus on or suddenly it magically appeared. Phosphorus is heavily dependent on microbial activity. And if anything is slowing down the activity of the, the microbes, and that could be cold, wet, it could also be excessively dry, um, then we're going to see less cycling of nutrients. So we're not just looking at the, the activity, the, 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 li the vitality of the microbes themselves, we're looking at the effects of what they do. We also saw something interesting in organic matter content. It was lowest in May, and it was highest at the end of the summer when after all the tillage had gotten done, which was almost totally backward of what we were told to assume. But it's interesting when the observations contradict our assumptions, most people would like to ignore the observations. We're, we're cutting into Dr. Sylvia's time. Um, and and, and we don't there. want to do that. But one more question. When do you recommend the best time of year to take soil samples? According to our um, SARE grant, during the active growing season, June and July, is you know when things are actively growing, is probably the most reflective of what's out there. You know, the biology is kind of, a, you know, if you have bad weather in the spring, it's always going to slow it down. But I found that that was probably the most stable time. Okay. Um, Go ahead and take a couple more questions. Okay. Push them on back. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, you were talking about a lot of the benefit that was in the roots if you're talking about the soil health and you're growing this culture. Do you have a recommendation? Yeah. For a long time, I plowed under the taller it was, the, green, the red clover, the better I thought it was. Where is the point where you think it's good and then you choose a plow or a uh, We We use both, but I think it's more how you use the tool and how the tool is adjusted. If we chisel plow, we have a huge increase in weeds. Because when, if you, sorry this is a long answer, but it's, a, it's an important detail. Uh, at the top of the soil, when the sun hits the ground, the weed seeds that are in that area are coming out of dormancy. It's kind of a signal the sun sends those weed seeds saying the conditions are right and it takes almost nothing except a little disturbance to make them come up. The seeds that are deeper are in a deep dormancy. That's how those seeds survive in the soil for so many years. So when we chisel plow, we sometimes have the weeds come up ahead of the crop. And there are times when that's really desirable, like in the fall, you want those weeds, to, you want to sucker them into coming up and get rid of them. So we moldboard plow. And we do some, we do no-till, we do minimum till, it all depends on the situation. But when we moldboard plow, we plow as shallow as we possibly can, and we use the European moldboard, which inverts the soil only 90 degrees at the bottom. It's a variable geometry, so that we're doing, it's more of a vertical tillage that the plow does. The top is fully inverted, so you get the weed control benefit, but the organic matter is not flipped to the bottom. It's kept kind of mixed more in a vertical orientation and it, that makes a tremendous difference. You can see the difference walking in the field. When we flip that organic matter down, especially when we plow deep, it's in an anaerobic zone where it will make alcohol, it makes carbon dioxide, but it really doesn't make humus and it does, it's not in the zone that feeds the crop, so it doesn't do us near as much good. So, it, And that, that's the challenge with organic matter and tillage. Yes, sir. Um, I've been sending my uh, soil samples to Midwest Labs for their, their uh, soil health test, and they come back with results kind of all over the map, and uh, we're in transition, so um, it seemed like a lot of things were going the wrong direction, and, um, and then, like now, in the, on the third test, the soil health comes up. Uh, is there a place that you would recommend to send samples for soil health test? 
The question is, where would we recommend sending soil samples to assess soil health? And this is, this is relatively a new field. It's, <coughs> labs forever have, have analyzed NPK. Um, but, that, but that is increasingly being shown to be totally inadequate to show whether a, a soil is in good shape. Um, there are labs that are developing soil health models um, to assess biological activity and uh, physical activity, physical characteristics also. Cornell has a, a soil health test that uh, is being used fairly widely. Um, uh, USDA, I think, is going to adapt many of the soil health tests that, the, that Cornell has developed. But the important thing is calibrating these tests. And the Soil Health Institute is one of our first pr uh, projects, is to standardize these soil health tests so that all labs across the country get basically the same results, so that you don't have that bias that comes from the lab. The, the more important problem with the soil health tests is what do we do about it? You know, how do we use that data? And how does that data translate into action? And it, it's not as simple as, you know, we're in, we're in that mindset with fertilizer that the test tells us what we have to buy. But when the soil health test results come back, it's more of now what do we do? And we're, we're working on gathering the data and doing the research to figure out what to do. The other problem we ran into is if you're straight corn soybeans, these tests probably can be compared year to year. But if you have a rotation, uh, what we're seeing is there's a huge biological impact and a huge uh, time of year impact that affects the results of your soil health test. That's on top of, but somewhat hides, the smaller, smaller long-term trend. So when you've got this cycling from biology, time of year, all the way through, how do you tell where you are in that cycle relative to the overall trend? And the best advice we have there is if it's done at the same time of year and in the same point of your rotation, you can compare those two points. That's, that's about the best we can tell you. We, we also recommend um, sampling the best fields and the best locations and fields on your farm. Um, oftentimes farmers will go out and test their worst fields to try to figure out what to do. But what's really important is to build an internal calibration so that you uh, know what the parameters look like on your farm when everything seems to be working well. Uh, and from that, you can compare that to where your, your results are. That's probably going to be more valuable long term than getting a consultant to tell you what it should be. Uh, the other thing with the soil health tests is it's not one test. You know, it's a whole battery of different tests, so that some of them we can tell you how to interpret the results very easily and very precisely. For instance, there is a disease suppressiveness index test for dry beans, so that if you are growing any kind of dry beans, this test will tell you whether you, what your level of disease pressure for root rot is. Now, that test is very easy to use because it'll, you'll get a number and it's going to correspond to what's going to happen if you plant dry beans in that field give you an indication of it's a good bet or what you need to do beforehand. Uh, the, the compaction, or the, what would you call it, the penetrometer tests, you could actually do yourself. The problem with them is that as the soil moisture changes, it'll change the penetrometer test, so when they do it in the lab, they actually take a core, they bring it to a known level of moisture, and then measure the pressure. And that's one of the calibration factors that we're trying to standardize between labs. So that if you split a sample and send it to two different labs, they're both going to give you this, the same numbers. Uh, those penetrometer tests are done with surface compaction and with deeper compaction. So you know how to interpret that. If you find that you have a deeper compaction, it would indicate that it may pay you to do some subsoiling. You know, that's, that's another example. The aggregate stability is probably the most important test. And I think the aggregate stability is the best indicator of water holding capacity. What Cornell is trying very hard now to index uh, a, the aggregate stability and a couple of other tests into a water holding capacity test so that it will predict how much water an inch of soil can actually store, which to me that's probably one of your more useful ones. But you're almost going to have to take these tests and then learn to interpret them yourself for your own farm because there are no consultants that have a big enough database or enough experience to do any better than you can do. I think we need to stop.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.